I wrote a book called Fateful Triangle, U.S., Israel, and the Palestinians, uh, focused on the war, discussed background and prospects. Now, the triangle remains a reasonable image, I suppose. It reappears in the title for these remarks, but it's kind of misleading. It's not an equilateral triangle. It's more like an isosceles triangle with a very narrow base so uh, that uh, uh, the other two sides are virtually parallel. A lot's changed since, but that remains true. Uh, the basic issues uh, remain. There are very broad issues of right and justice with deep historical roots. <clears throat> uh, there are narrow but crucial ones about policy sh choices for the short term. I'll, they will lay the basis for what comes. I'll keep to this latter topic in these brief comments. <coughs> that means keeping to the post-67 period, though obviously that's only part of the story. Uh, immediately after the 67 war, Israel initiated the settlement policies that continue to the present and some of the leading figures made the uh, purpose quite explicit. Uh, the most important was Moshe Dayan, Minister of Defense in charge of the occupied territories. Uh, he said, we must consolidate our hold <clears throat> so that over time we will succeed in digesting Judea and Samaria, the West Bank, and merging them with our little Israel. Meanwhile, dismembering the territorial contiguity of and contiguity of the West Bank, uh, we should establish what he called permanent rule, Memshelet Keva in Hebrew. Now, that would have to be done by expropriating land from Arab owners under the pretense, I'm quoting him, the pretense that the step is necessary for military purposes. Now, these are uh, procedures that Israel had conducted repeatedly with inside what he called little Israel. Uh, famous cases, Carmiel, uh, he informed his colleagues that we should uh, tell the Palestinians that we have nothing for them. Uh, they will live like dogs, and whoever will leave will leave, and we'll see where that leads to. Uh, he, he recognized that this is in violation of international law, but he said uh, states violate international law, so we will too. Uh, and they can when the superpower uh, master of the world approves. Uh, by now, the illegality is beyond serious discussion. Uh, that includes the Security Council. So, for example, in 1979, the UN Security Council passed a resolution 446, uh, which stated that the policy and practices of Israel in establishing settlements in the Palestinian and other Arab territories occupied since 1967 have no legal validity and constitute a serious obstruction to achieving a comprehensive, just, and lasting peace in the Middle East, ordered them terminated. Now, that was passed 12 to 0, with the U.S. and Britain abstaining. Uh, it now includes the International Court of Justice, that includes the U.S. justice on the crucial issue. Uh, it also includes Israel itself. Uh, right after 1967, uh, Israel's leading legal authority, Theodore Meron, now a distinguished international legal figure, uh, he informed the government that any settlement at all in the occupied territories would be in violation of uh, uh, the Geneva Convention's basic uh, international humanitarian law. Uh, he was backed in that by the Attorney General, Yaakov Shimshon Shapiro, and as I mentioned, Diane as well. Uh, in illegally annexed East Jerusalem and the Golan, Syrian Golan Heights, there are specific Security Council condemnations uh, right away. In fact, in 1968, <clears throat> Israeli unification of Jerusalem establishing the capital was declared illegal by the Security Council, 13 to 0, two abstentions, the United States and Canada. 
was reiterated in 1980 with the U.S. alone abstaining. Uh, with regard to the Golan Heights, uh, even the United States uh, agreed and joined in 1981 in declaring the annexation and settlement Ill illegal. Uh, interestingly, a few days ago, <clears throat> the New York Times referred to the Golan Heights as disputed uh, territory. Uh, they're keeping obediently to U.S. practice, which is in violation of official policy, even the Security Council vote. Well, in uh, the next major step was in 1971, when President Sadat of Egypt uh, offered Israel a full peace treaty. This is through Gunnar Yaring, the international mediator. Full peace treaty, uh, no mention of the Palestinians except as refugees, uh, in, in return for uh, Israeli withdrawal from the occupied territories. He cared only about the Suez Canal. Uh, Israel then had the Suez uh, re Egyptian Sinai. Uh, the, uh, is, the Israeli cabinet considered the offer, uh, rejected it, uh, making a very fateful decision. Uh, they were preferring expansion to security. Peace treaty would have it, with Egypt would have meant total security, but they were then expanding into the Egyptian Sinai and preferred that. Well, the important question, as always, is what the U.S. will do. Now, there was an internal debate in the United States. Uh, uh, Henry Kissinger won the debate and imposed the policy that he called stalemate. Uh, eight years later, in his memoirs, he explained this. He said, until some Arab state showed a willingness to separate from the Soviets, or the Soviets were prepared to dissociate from the maximum Arab program, we had no reason to modify our policy of stalemate, no negotiations, just force. That's pretty astonishing. It's unbelievable that he didn't know that um, Saudi Arabia uh, didn't, couldn't separate from the Soviets, didn't even have relation, diplomatic relations with them, and Egypt was eagerly trying to separate from the Soviets. Uh, and as far as the Russians were concerned, uh, their position was extremely moderate. It was right in the mainstream of international opinion. In fact, uh, even official, but not actual, U.S. opinions. It's kind of interesting that scholarship permits Kissinger to get away with these ludicrous remarks, as it does. Well, so uh, after uh, the U.S. rejection, uh, Sadat removed the Russian advisors, tried in every possible way to get uh, the United States to join him in calling for peace. There was no reaction. And that led to the October 73 war, which is a very close thing for Israel. And indeed for the world, there was a threat of nuclear war. Now, there are some recently declassified documents from the Israeli and U.S. archives that uh, shed a good deal of light on what happened. And this is a very crucial moment. Now, Kissinger later recognized that, as he puts it, during 1973, it was possible to prevent war. And the archives report his meetings with uh, Sadat's advisor, uh, Hafez Ismail, uh, before the war. And Kissinger says, frankly, what, what, what I did in these meetings was to speak with him about the weather and every other topic in the world, just so that we didn't touch on the subject of an agreement. I attempted to gain time, postpone it month after month. We didn't desire talks. So stalemate, force, no negotiations. Then came the war. Uh, Kissinger went as far as calling a nuclear alert uh, to warn the Russians to keep out while he was secretly advising Israel that they could violate the ceasefire that had been imposed by the U.S. and Russia. His goal explicitly was to keep control uh, after the wreckage for which he was largely responsible. Uh, that led to ship shuttle diplomacy, finally the Camp David agreements of 78-79. Uh, that's hailed in the United States as a diplomatic triumph. It's actually a diplomatic catastrophe. Uh, it led to the, what happened, the, the rejection of Sadat's offer in 71. 
uh, led to terrible suffering, uh, very serious threats. Uh, the United States in 78, 79 essentially accepted Sadat's 1971 proposal, uh, but in a form that was harsher from the U.S.-Israeli standpoint. It involved now formal recognition of Palestinian rights. Of course, this was immediately ignored by Israel and the U.S. remained silent. Uh, meanwhile, Palestinian national rights had reached the international agenda. In January 1976, a Security Council resolution, uh, yeah, Security Council resolution uh, uh, called, was proposed by uh, Syria, uh, Egypt, Jordan, so-called confrontation states, uh, calling uh, for establishment of a two-state uh, a settlement on the internationally recognized border with, and then came the wording of UN 242, recognition of the rights of every state in the region to peace and security within secure and recognized borders. That was vetoed by the United States. Uh, I won't run through the rest of the record. It continues uh, until today. The most recent Security Council resolution, which was somewhat noteworthy uh, enough to be reported, uh, uh, called for a f uh, endorsed official U.S. policy, namely ending settlement expansion that was vetoed by Obama. That vote ended and veto ended any discussion of settlement expansion. Well, meanwhile, other events were occurring. The first intifada took place. Something had to be done. Uh, the U.S. initiated the Madrid negotiations. They got nowhere. Uh, the Palest the head of the Palestinian delegation, Haider al-Shafi, Abd al-Shafi, uh, insisted that any agreement must end growth of settlements, so it broke down. Uh, meanwhile, the Tunis Arabs, Yasser Arafat, uh, made an end run around the local Palestinians, that's the Oslo agreements, they reached an agreement with Israel which said nothing about settlement expansion. Uh, Abdul Shafi, in fact, refused to uh, even attend the celebratory meeting. Settlements continued without a break. The intentions became increasingly obvious. Uh, by now, they're not in doubt. Uh, the, uh, they do go back to the 60s, but now it's very explicit. Israel will take everything within the separation wall, basically an annexation wall. It'll take the Jordan Valley. Uh, Palestinians are being expelled, uh, military zones are being established to prevent Palestinian settlement. Meanwhile, Israeli settlements continue. Uh, wells are being uh, dug all over and so on. Uh, there are corridors cutting through what remains, leaving unviable cantons. Uh, the goal is to take probably close to a half of the West Bank uh, area, what's called Area C, where the Palestinian Authority has no independent powers, is 60% of the West Bank, about a third of it is closed military zones, 40% uh, of settlements are on private land, it's essentially being taken over. Uh, Oslo will be, uh, uh, Gaza will be kept as a prison, separated from the West Bank, that's actually been U.S.-Israeli policy since the Oslo agreements, which declared the two to be an inseparable territorial unity, and uh, uh, Israel will keep the Syrian Golan Heights. Those are the policies now being implemented. A couple of days ago, the United States warned the European Union not to support the Palestinians at the UN, uh, urging again that the only pass is, path is negotiations. Now, the kind of official line in the West is that the Palestinians are insisting on preconditions. Uh, the opposite is true. The United States and Israel are insisting on crucial preconditions. One is that the negotiations be under U.S. auspices, uh, which means that the two legs of the triangle will be in parallel, uh, and also that settlements will continue to, uh, to expand, uh, either openly or by deception, as during the 10-month settlement freeze. Well, that's roughly where we are now. Let me just say a couple of words about the prospects and the options. <clears throat> One option is well known. International consensus, roughly along the lines of the 1976 uh, 
vetoed Security Council resolution. Now, that's supported by essentially everybody, apart from the two rejectionist states, the US and Israel. That could lay the basis for moving on to closer integration, uh, federation, by national state uh, eroding the imperial borders, which there's no reason to worship. Uh, for what it's worth, these longer term goals are pretty much what I've personally advocated for 70 years, often writing about it. Uh, an alternative is commonly suggested now, namely give the keys to Israel, one state civil rights struggle, anti-apartheid struggle. Uh, that second alternative overlooks a crucial fact there isn't the slightest reason to expect Israel to accept the keys. The reason is that there's a third option, namely the one that the US and Israel are now pursuing, which I've already described. Uh, in that case, there's no so-called demographic problem. Uh, the very few Palestinians in the areas that Israel will take over, uh, no civil rights struggle. Uh, 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 there are many analogies to South Africa, mostly irrelevant in my opinion. Uh, it's true that the sometimes the scattered cantons are called Bantustans, actually. Ariel Sharon even used that, but that's misleading too. Uh, South Africa had reason to sustain the Bantustans. That was their labor supply. Tried to develop them, tried to gain international recognition. Didn't gain any apart from Israel. Uh, but uh, Israel has absolutely no interest in the uh, cantons. It just, it's pretty much like what Dayan said, let them leave. Uh, Mustafa Barghouti a couple of days ago pointed out accurately that it's far worse than South African apartheid, essentially, for these reasons. There is actually one analogy with South Africa that's highly relevant. Uh, in 1958, the uh, we know from internal documents that, uh, yes, we know from internal documents that in 1958, <clears throat> the uh, nationalist regime in South Africa recognized uh, that they're becoming international pariahs. Uh, the foreign minister called in the American ambassador and spoke to him. He said, we know that everyone's voting against us in the United Nations. We're becoming pariahs, but it really doesn't matter. There's only, you and I both know that there's only one vote in the United Nations. That's yours. Uh, and as long as you support us, it doesn't matter what else happened. And that's pretty much the way it worked out. Uh, under Reagan in the 1980s, uh, in the framework of his war on terror, uh, the uh, African National Congress was declared to be uh, one of the more notorious terrorist groups in the world. Uh, Mandela was on the terrorist list. That was 1988. Uh, in fact, Mandela was removed from the terrorist list just about two years ago. Uh, by 1990, however, U.S. policy had shifted. Uh, also, Cuba had driven the South Africans out of illegally occupied Namibia. And when these events happened, including the shift in U.S. policy, uh, apartheid shortly ended. That's a major victory for justice, even though only partial as the recent minor strike and the brutal state reaction vividly illustrates. That's not the only such case. Now, there are others. It's conceivable that U.S. policy might shift. Now, for example, the United States might accept the uh, proposals of the major human rights group uh, groups like Am Amnesty International, which called for an arms embargo on Israel, or Human Rights Watch, which called for an end to any U.S. aid to Israel that either uh, is involved in any way with the settlements in the occupied territories or with discrimination within Israel. It's a strong demand coming from a central organization. Uh, there's plenty of popular support for that, uh, even in the United States, uh, and it could expand, it could lead to a change of policy. And if that doesn't happen, I think the prospects look pretty grim. <clears throat> I, I am very pleased to tell you that Cindy and Gray Corey just arrived during the interview of Noam Chomsky, and uh, maybe we can. Welcome to you. 
such a respected and beloved person in the world community, um, was able to come to us uh, via Skype, Noam Chomsky, uh, who is not feeling particularly well, but who made this effort because all of his life, actually, he's made the effort to understand what has been really going on in the world instead of leaving it to the media and other places. So we thank him uh, deeply and we wish him the best of health. Roger, do you have something to say? Um. I would say hear, hear, and I was happy to hear uh, his voice coming out of the darkness, um, acknowledging, uh, acknowledging uh, Amnesty and Human Rights Watch as, a, as a possible elements in a way out of uh, this unholy mess that we all find ourselves in. Um, I thought it was extremely dramatic the way he stopped after having said, that's one way can, we can go, and if we don't go that way, So, uh, so I, so I too uh, thank him from uh, from afar from being part of this um, this afternoon. It's very moving, but also very chilling. <laughs>